I've always been interested in contributing to open source projects. What's a good way to get started? Love that question because there's so many good ways to get started. You could get started by just helping triage issues. So many open source projects have issues where the maintainers, they don't know if it's a real bug or not. A lot of repositories also have what are called good first issues. Home Assistant is this cool open source org in Home Assistant. Look at that. They have 2.9k issues. Do you see that? There's, oh, they have so many labels. That's amazing. Um, good first issue. Aha, they've already got some here where it's like, this is a good first issue for you to take on and fix. And also generally just thinking, what are some projects that I use that I care about that I might be able to help with? Hi developers. VS Code users can now access a powerful new code completion model, GPT-4 O-Mini. This model has been trained on over 275,000 high-quality public repositories covering more than 30 programming languages. You can expect this model to provide more accurate suggestions and better performance. To enable it, if you have Command Center enabled, click down the arrow next to the Copilot icon, select Configure Code Completions, choose Change Code Completions Model, and you're set. Alternatively, if you're using the command palette, you can press Ctrl Shift P for Windows or Linux or Command Shift P for Mac. Type Change Completions Model, select your preferred model from the drop down, and that's it. Happy coding. Welcome back to GitHub Podcast. We are recording live from GitHub Universe, and I am so excited. We are at the end of the day, but we have a very, very special guest. As soon as I tell you who it is, you'll feel like you either know him or you attended one of his events, or in some way, if you've been to any hackathon ever, you know that there has been a mark there that's been left by this human. Welcome, John. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about TLDR about yourself? Totally. I'm the co-founder of Major League Hacking, which is the largest community of early career developers in the world. So we work with hundreds of thousands of people who are learning to code, building their skills, and entering the tech industry, primarily on college campuses. We have chapters on campuses all over the world where students can go build community and build their skills in tech. I've been doing it for about 10 years now. Wow. So it's a long, long run. Have you got an average estimate of how many Mm, let's see. I don't know if by students or events mm -hmm. in the 10 year journey of MLH. Like, yeah. So we actually recently passed a million all time developers and we didn't even notice. So someone on our team was like pulling some data for a report we were putting together. Yeah. And they noticed that the ticker was like 1.1 million. And we were like, oh man, like we didn't even notice when we passed a million. That's what and I so think. we had a retroactive celebration, but it was a big milestone for us. Like having a million people on college campuses means that. Basically, a critical mass of people in the tech industry right now have gone through our programs when they were starting out. That's phenomenal. And you are worldwide. Mm -hmm. this... We are worldwide, 90 countries. We have seen students do all sorts of things in basically every language out there. And most of them I don't understand, but people are building amazing stuff. That is remarkable. And of course, for folks who are not familiar with Amelage, like what does it cost a person to come and use your resources and yeah. have your guidance? Like, what is that? How do you operate? Yeah, so all of our programs are free for students. Yes. Uh, we want to make it as accessible as possible. The way it gets funded is from corporate partners. So okay. we work with a lot of developer relations teams, a lot of talent teams to introduce students to their platforms and their career opportunities as early as we possibly can. Because we realize that, you know, most people who are going through CS programs or even teaching themselves to code yeah. don't get exposed to real world tools. No chance. And the earlier you have that, the more likely it is that they'll be successful entering the industry. That is such a good point. You bring me to something actually I wanted to talk about yeah. because and I've met a lot of folks that don't even, they, and, you know, not, maybe not so, so recent graduates because I think yeah. that we're, we're shifting. I think part of the work that you've done is actually like inform academia, like, listen, mm -hmm. we got to start teaching this. But I know people that are, you know, like colleagues, they didn't even mm -hmm. learn version control in, in school. Yeah. Now I feel like it's very unlikely someone graduates without having a GitHub account or understanding or having 
some kind of version control. It's interesting to me that that wasn't the norm before. Curriculum lags behind industry mm. always. GitHub has done a really good job of building tools to actually enable professors to utilize version control in their courses. We've done a lot of work with GitHub Education over the years to introduce students to it. Even if you use it in class, a lot of times you don't understand the full scope of what you can do oh, with Git sure. or GitHub or version control as a concept. And there's a lot of depth there that students can get into as they actually start using it in their own projects outside of the classroom. But yeah, I think that we shouldn't expect that curriculum will adapt to the most modern tools because it's meant to teach you the fundamentals. You need some kind of supplementary programs to teach you whatever is going on at that moment in time in a more nimble way, right? Like computer science theory doesn't change that often, but the tools change every day. Mm, I love that. And also like nothing teaches you like hands-on experience. Mm -hmm. I think like there is so much value. I've had the fortune to attend a couple of hackathons and my gosh, it's incredible. You learn things about yourself, yeah. honestly. You learn how to work in a team. You learn mm -hmm. how, no, there is the upside to attending hackathons. If you're a student, you're not a student. It doesn't matter. Like it's, you, you come out with a good experience and value add. And having the exposure to those tools, I wonder like what, for example, MLA is doing. I know mm -hmm. that you work with a lot of corporate partners, but how are you making sure that students are actually getting to use and actually apply the tools that they're going to use when they go get a job? Yeah. So... I mean, there's a lot of different ways that, that um, the first thing we try to do is actually make it interesting for students. If you go out there and you're like, hey, here's an enterprise data privacy tool, you know, that's not a good hook. People aren't going to understand why they would want to use that. Right. And so we put a lot of time and effort into translating all of the enterprise -y language that developer platforms inevitably have mm -hmm. into something that's like exciting for an individual developer to test out because you Maybe you do want to learn about data privacy and maybe you don't understand how that applies to the project that you have in mind. And if we can make that exciting, then students are more likely to try it. And frankly, developers generally are more likely to try it. This is true. I, I think that hackathons are, are incredibly powerful at any stage of your career. We focus on students because it's an audience of people who are primed to learn all the time. But, you know, for a long time before MLH, I was doing professional hackathons and helping run developer relations programs. And, you know, there's no substitute for setting aside time and place to build. Absolutely. Even internally, I feel like there's a lot of companies, even Microsoft, like their host yep. internal hackathons, we do something similar as well. And it's so cool because then you also get to work on things that maybe is not your day to day. So it kind of pushes you a little bit to look at a different side of the company or Maybe you fix the one problem that is not your org's problem, but you're yeah. like, if I could just fix the one thing. That is so great. For folks who never participated in a hackathon, maybe I don't have the time. There's already a full <laughs> school load. Besides the promise of a good time, what would you say to them so they get inspired and come? Yeah, I mean, for students, a lot of it's about the free food and swag, to okay. be honest. But, you know, I think that it's about the people. Mm -hmm. That tends to be the main draw for newcomers. We find that the most likely reason someone's going to attend their first hackathon is because a friend invited them. Mm -hmm. For me, honestly, like when I first heard the idea of a hackathon, I was like, that sounds like a terrible way to spend my weekend. Yeah. What yeah. really drew me in is a friend of mine who was like, you got to come to this. I know you're going to love it. I know it doesn't sound oh great, gosh, but yeah. you have to come with me. And they cajoled me into going with them. And it totally changed my life and my career. And I think a lot of people have similar experiences where it's like, if you have that support network, if you have someone who's yeah. sort of getting you outside your comfort zone, they can get you to take that leap and try something new and it can have a life-changing impact. The pitch I always give people is every developer I've ever met, whether they're writing their first line of code mm -hmm. or whether they're 10 years into their career, has a million ideas on the back burner. And the hardest thing for people is to actually set aside time to do that. And it gets harder as you get deeper in your mm -hmm. career. And hackathons create this sort of like siloed like magical time and space where you're surrounded by tons of people building stuff and you're also able to build stuff because you have no distractions mm -hmm. food is provided swag is there you have people who can help you debug your code in the middle of the night there's literally no reason you can't be successful because everything is designed to help you accomplish whatever idea you came in with I love that. I've seen so many hackathons now. Actually, we are organizing one in South Africa. I need to talk to you. So let's talk about AI tools and how oh, yeah. they play into this dynamic of not only going to hackathons, organizing hackathons. Like, how do you see that impacting the education space, really? Because what you're yeah. doing, you're providing education for folks. So yeah, I mean, I have been in the tech industry for 
a good amount of time now. I think this is the most excited I've seen developers about a new technology ever. I've seen a lot of hype cycles, and like this one really feels different. It's changing how people think about what they can accomplish in a certain period of time. That's the biggest thing I've noticed. After you've been to hundreds of hackathons like I have and like MLH has, you start to get a sense for what is possible in a weekend. Everything changed when these AI coding tools came out, whether they're using Copilot, whether they're using ChatGPT, Claude, like whatever. They can do way more with way less time and frankly, way less experience. And, you know, I don't entirely know what the implications will be for the industry at large, but like we just see much more impressive projects and people getting their result much more quickly because they're able to leverage like what what I describe as like an always on mentor and always on pair yes. programmer and always on, you know, documentation resource. And it's really changed the game completely. I love that. I feel like it's definitely more empowering. And then of course, if you're, if that's one of your hesitations to attend, well, I don't feel like I'm, strong enough and xyz yeah. or if it's topic specific hackathon like now you can have a hand like yeah and, and it's non-judgmental it's you know? my favorite the psychological safety of your ai copilot a hundred percent yeah we I'm see there. a lot of students like asking ai instead of asking their ta because yeah. they feel like there is literally no question too stupid to ask an AI. Yes. I feel that way personally. Oh, same, same. And you know what's been really interesting since we started using tools? And well, of course, I'm not, I, I've used them all, folks. And I'm team, use the tool that makes you happy. Obviously, I work at GitHub, so majority of my access and experience has been with GitHub Copilot. But yeah. it's, it's really taught me how to communicate a lot better yep. what I want to accomplish. So getting the thing out of my head mm -hmm. and start thinking about like prompt engineering principles and really being able to, that's going to help me regardless whether it's code or life. Like, <laughs> I feel like I can see the leap on the way that I'm communicating ideas and concepts now. And the sauce has been using the tool. That's been, it's been pushing me to think a certain way. So I can only imagine how that can impact folks that are starting, their, whether they're just now learning or like early career. That's amazing. You're getting ahead. That's so cool. Yeah, and I think that like, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about how do people prevent cheating with AI? Yeah. How do you like, you know, X, Y, Z, like whatever. And I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I think that, like, the smartest professors, the smartest teachers I know, like I was talking to David Malin earlier from CS50, who's, like, you know, a genius, it, genius right? prolific Very person, right? But he's using AI yes, they are. as a teaching assistant, essentially. Yeah. And I think that that is the bleeding edge of education, is, mm -hmm. like, using it as a, a way to help people understand concepts and learn more quickly, not as a way to, like, get a solution. And if your assignments are only designed around the solution, that's a bad assignment. Then you're not teaching. Oh, my yeah. gosh, I love that. Yeah. Can you please put that on a T-shirt? We could, yeah. <laughs> really? No, that's fantastic. John, thank you so much for yeah. stopping by. What's going on next with MLH? Anything coming up that you want to share? We have a lot of big stuff coming up series of events called Global Hack Week that happens once a month. The next one's coming up in a couple of weeks. And I'm sure whenever you're listening to this, there will be one in a couple of weeks. But it's an amazing festival of thousands of developers coming together online to learn new concepts, try new skills, and really just, you know, have a great community experience. And if you're a professional, if you're a student, check it out. And it's virtual. So anywhere in the world. That's amazing. Well, we'll have to drop a link to it. So even if it has passed the one that's coming up. Like you said, it's evergreen every month. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate you. And tell us where we can follow you online. I'm John Mark Go on every social media platform known to humanity. Check it out. I'm on all the different Tweet X, Blue Sky, whatever Mastodon apps. All of them. Uh, if anyone ever has any questions about MLH or hackathons in general, drop me a line. I super appreciate that openness. Thank you so much. Listen, I've only just met a little bit more. John, I met you years ago, but yeah. we didn't see that much. And I. He'll answer the, the message. <laughs> I can tell. I, I can tell. So thank you so much. So remember, J-O-N-M-A-R-K, go, G-O. You can follow John on all social. Connect with John if you want to bring MLH to your town if it's not there. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, John. I appreciate you. Happy hacking. <laughs> hey, happy hacking. <laughs>